Global Digital Summer School on Quantum Computing. And I see uh, we have reposted the link. All right, so, oh, Sausalito, California. I live, that's where, it's very close to where I grew up. Now, we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar series dedicated to the research and academic communities. This, this seminar takes place every Friday at noon, Eastern time, right now at this uh, hour, on the Kiskin YouTube channel. And I'm delighted to see so many of you already tuned in. I am your host, Slack the Minute, from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the privilege of hosting uh, Guillaume Verdun from Google X and, and also from the Institute of Quantum Computing at Waterloo. Uh, Guillaume will present some very nice results. And hello, Guillaume. How are you today? Hi, Zlatko. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, last time we met, I think it was right after March meeting was canceled and we were at March meeting. Uh, so I'm glad that we can continue the uh, discussions and uh, have everyone join us today on the call. That's right. The science goes on, tumultuous times, but that's right. Indeed, indeed. I hope you've been doing well. Uh, Guillaume, in addition to being a social media celebrity, as some of you may know, is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo at the Institute of uh, Quantum Computing. I had a very nice visit there recently, so a uh, great place. He is also a research scientist at X, uh, Google X, or Alphabet's uh, Research and Development Lab. Uh, before this, uh, Guillaume briefly worked at Google AI Quantum and was one of the co-founders of TensorFlow Quantum Project. He holds a master's in math and quantum info from U Waterloo, as well as an honors math and physics degree from a given university. Um, and I think we have some very interesting questions to discuss today. I think as many of you know, quantum computing operates in an exponential space. So how does classical machine learning uh, and learning classical distribution, for instance, which also operates in an exponential space mesh, how can we learn uh, new and interesting correlations and work with not just pure states, but non-pure states. And these are just some of the things uh, Guillaume will tell us about today. And maybe as I advertise uh, your talk and describe the format, Guillaume, maybe you can pull up your slides. Yep. All right. Cool. The talk uh, format is the usual. Uh, you can ask questions in the comment sidebar box uh, on the right-hand side, usually, or below. And I will triage those questions and ask Guillaume uh, in real time. Uh, so. Q&A is during and after. And I think it's time we get started. So it's my pleasure right. to turn it over to you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Zlatko, and thank you to the invitation. And it's very nice to uh, get to uh, speak to the whole uh, quantum community here. I uh, really enjoy uh, watching these seminars. So it's, it's my honor to get to talk in one of these. So today, I guess I'll be talking broadly about uh, quantum machine learning and, and some context uh, comparing it to classical machine learning and deep learning and then uh, getting into some recent work uh, from various internships and during my PhD uh, on uh, yeah. taking inspiration from classical machine learning to uh, create new types of quantum models and algorithms. So <clears throat> as Lacko mentioned, uh, often in quantum machine learning, uh, there is this conception that uh, if, if we go to, if we use a quantum computer in a sense, we're operating in a exponentially large space and, and thus we should get exponential amounts of, of power, of uh, machine learning power, right? But uh, that, is, that is somewhat of a mis misconception because for a very long time, classical computers and analog classical electronics have been able to do uh, probabilistic computing, right? And as we know, quantum theory is kind of an extension or, or generalization of probability theory to include uh, complex numbers known as of wave functions, right? And um, probabilities are obtained from wave functions by taking the amplitude uh, squared or the absolute value squared of uh, various these complex numbers. And from that, we get the probability of various outcomes, right? That is uh, known as the Born rule. Right, but uh, you know, on the classical side, we can have mixtures of zero and one, right? Zero or, or one in a different combination. Whereas on the quantum side, we have superpositions. It's not zero and one, it's not zero or one, it's a superposition with certain values of complex numbers, right? So overall, I guess the theme of the talk is to uh, you know, take inspiration from classical probability theory and take inspiration 
from a subset of machine learning called probabilistic machine learning to come up with new quantum models because the theories are very much analogous and can in fact be hybridized as we'll, we will see. So if you have uh, you know, n probits, probabilistic bits, uh, they also operate in a space that is exponential, right? You have uh, a probability distribution over the space of bit strings, and you, you can have a mixture of two to the n possible bit strings, right? And there's many, uh, as we'll see, machine learning models that are made to represent uh, such distributions or, or generate such distributions. And on the quantum side, you know, for pure states, at least, um, they're uh, written as a wave function of, of the sort um, and uh, have two to the n uh, complex numbers for n qubits, right? So there's a lot of similarities, right? And there's a difference, the uh, complex number and the real number. Uh, that's important. Uh, that, that gives, in a sense, quantum computing uh, its power over uh, classical algorithms. But instead of you know, having this constant uh, competition, I guess, between uh, classical computing and quantum computing, you know, the, the philosophy, uh, at least of my research, is to try to leverage as much classical computing as possible, and including probabilistic uh, computing, and hybridize it with quantum computation. In a sense, we, we want to leverage quantum computers for what they're, very, they're the best at, right? And we want to add this such that there's a value add by using quantum computers hybridized with classical computing. So this is a, a philosophy, and it's uh, of, of research, and... Uh, you know, there, there are various schools of thought in quantum computing, and, and this is the one I'm, I'm I guess, uh, I'm vouching for. So, you know, what, what actually gives quantum computers their power, right? Well, uh, you know, there's been various demonstrations that uh, sampling uh, from a unitary circuit that is quite deep and has a large space-time volume, a unitary quantum circuit, is quite difficult for classical computers, right? One has to do Feynman paths or tensor networks and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, the difficulty scales exponentially uh, asymptotically with uh, the volume of space time, right? Um, so that, that we know, that's the power of quantum computers is to sample from such circuits. So how do we incorporate this exact thing, sampling from unitaries, in, and integrate it with the capabilities of classical, modern classical machine learning to obtain you know, something more powerful than, than either, either piece individually, um, right? So quantum computers are becoming more powerful to the point of being unsimulatable. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I won't get into whether the boundary has been crossed or not. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting debate on its own. Uh, but how do you, you know, how, even if we have this power, how do you actually leverage this power for, for something uh, you know, relevant, that is, is not just, just a, a demonstration. Um, so in a sense, the meta area of focus, at least in the, in the near term, has been quantum AI, right? And what is quantum AI? I like to subdivide it into two subfields that are dominant for now. There are other subfields that could be analogous to the subfields of classical AI. Uh, but for now, it seems like the community is focused on two broad categories and uh, one is uh, quantum enhanced optimization. So that is accelerating classical algorithms of optimization and search using quantum or quantum inspired dynamics and uh, quantum deep learning. Uh, and I have, uh, you know, many people call these variational algorithms. I'll justify my nomenclature in a second. Um, what I consider quantum deep learning is learning quantum representations of quantum or classical data. So there's a lot to unpack there. So we're gonna spend a few slides trying to unpack what it means to do, to have a representation for quantum data. This is gonna be the focus of my talk today. Quantum deep learning, learning a multi-layered quantum computation based representation of quantum or classical data distributions. What is a computational representation of data, right? Or a deep multi-layered rep computational representation of data. Representations, right? Let, let's Let's, Go back to classical deep representation learning theory, aka deep learning, uh, and try to understand a bit of the context. So, so deep learning is a subset of machine learning, a subset of AI, a subset of computer science, and which is of course a subset of science. And I guess the gist of it is that neural networks, you know, when they learn something, 
uh, they got to be able to, in a sense, recreate it. You know, Feynman said, "What I cannot create, I do not understand." And your favorite deep neural network, if you could ask, if you, you could ask it uh, what it thinks, it would probably say something similar, uh, like this quote. Um, what, what do we mean by recreate? So here I'm going to get more rigorous. Uh, so usually you have a data set, which is set of points sampled from a true distribution, p true of x, right? Um, and uh, so you, you have a certain finite set of data points, right? You don't have the full distribution that you could query. Uh, you're trying to learn a approximative model. Um, and uh, you're trying to approximate this distribution over a certain domain of interest that goes beyond the data set itself, because you, you, you already have uh, the data points for that are in the data set. But you're trying to extend it beyond uh, the data set. And you have a parameterized hypothesis class, or uh, in classical machine learning, we call it a variational distribution, a variational classical probability distribution. And phi here would represent a set of uh, parameters, right? Because usually uh, these distributions are parameterized using something called deep neural nets, as we'll see in a second. Uh, but the goal is to approximate uh, a true distribution with a variational uh, distribution. And uh, you know the, the idea is to uh, minimize the discrepancy between the true distribution and our uh, our variational distribution over the data set, and hope that it extends uh, beyond the data set. Right. So that would be for generative modeling. We're just trying to learn the raw distribution of all our data in what is called discriminative modeling, which includes you know classifiers such as like labor, labeling a picture of a cat or a dog or or regression, uh, neural regression, which is trying to get a scalar out of uh, out of uh, data. So you know maybe uh, a certain uh, continuous value instead of a discrete uh, label. Um, but in general, we have pairs of inputs and outputs, right? And discriminative learning is very similar. It can be phrased in probabilistic language as we're trying to learn a conditional distribution, right? Uh, random variables can be correlated and they can have what are called conditional uh, distributions. Uh, hopefully my, OK, we can see the last line here. So the idea is that deterministic functions, such as most uh, deep neural networks, are actually, you know, they're a subset of this conditional distributions. They're kind of uh, delta functions. If you're used to the delta measure uh, in, in function space, if you integrate over it, uh, then you, you get the value y equals f of x. Right, so it's just a very sharp distribution, right? So most of classical machine learning, or, or I guess the the popular parts of of deep learning, often deal with kind of deterministic pointwise functions, whereas the the more general theory is actually based on probability and information theory, right? And that's kind of the roots of machine learning and what we're trying to get back to with quantum, because we are in the early days. Uh, where we must understand from first principles what we're doing instead of just uh, trying stuff and iterating on the engineering of different algorithms, uh, you know, willy-nilly. We want to be guided in our research. Um, so, you know, deep learning are algorithms to ident identify patterns in data. Uh, you use multi-layered parameterized computations to learn representations of data. Representations are multi, you know, deep representations are multi-step computations that either take you from your data space to a simplified space or from a simple space to your data space, right? So in the case of uh, discriminative learning, you're trying to take the input space, say the pictures of cats, and go to the label space, you know, is it cat or dog, a sing single bit instead of many, many pixels, right? Uh, in generative learning, you're, you're starting from a very simple set of uh, randomness, say a set of Gaussian samples, or a set of random coin flips, and trying to turn that randomness into uh, the randomness over, say, the the set of pictures uh, of bedrooms, right? The possible set of pictures of bedrooms, and you're trying to sample new uh, data points from from that uh, data set. Uh, in terms of math, we say you know we're we're searching for a sub manifold of your 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 space, right? And if it's all continuously parameterized, it's it's technically uh, a manifold. Um, again, this is what I just described. Uh, you have some randomness. A generative model would go to this, some complicated space. You know, uh, machine learning folks and deep learning folks really love pictures. Uh, 
quantum folks love wave functions and mixed states, uh, as we'll see. Uh, but uh, you know, discriminative learning would go to uh, a simple space, and then once it's simplified, it's easy to separate out the two class. So again, representations. Every time I say representations, don't don't freak out. It's just parameterized multi-step computation, and deep is uh, multi-layer, uh, and the building block is uh, neural networks. So I think I'm going to skip over this theory. This is an example of uh, uh, a uh, unsupervised learning algorithm called a variational autoencoder. It's a way to compress data. So you go to a compressed space, and by compressing, you're going to be forced to decorrelate the data and get a very simple, uh, very simple uh, randomness. And you could fit that simple randomness, say, with Gaussians. And then if you plug it through, in a sense, the reverse transformation, you get your data set again, right? And I want to show this because it's going to be very similar to our quantum approach, where you could go in reverse through a quantum classical transformation. And then you have a very simple, what is called a latent space, a hidden space. And then when you, when you want to generate the data again, you go from latent space to the visible space, right? Uh, and these are very cool because you know you can, in latent space, uh, if you just train the network to, to search for interesting features in general, they can find uh, features uh, that, and then you could do kind of uh, logic in latent space. So maybe there's a vector that corresponds to glasses, to, to gender, to age, and so on, and you could play around in latent space and see what you generate on the other side. So, you know, for quantum, exa for example, if you have properties of materials you're trying to detect and you're trying to generate new materials or new materials with properties, uh, having a latent space that you've detected to play with it can be very uh, useful. And of course, unsupervised learning itself is also useful in, in classical, uh, and sorry, in uh, discriminative learning because finding a compressed representation is already part of the, the job to, uh, to, to separate out classes. So imagine we, we had you know, three different classes and we compressed it to some space that's two dimensional. And then we could go from a two-dimensional space to three different class labels of which color of the blob it corresponds to. So uh, again, so I'm, I'm going to be focused on unsupervised learning, but a lot of this actually applies to uh, uh, supervised or discriminative learning. Um, so what consists of a good representation? I won't go too much into this, but at a high level, you want the representation capacity. Are you able to capture or you know, reproduce the data set? Uh, for some value of your parameters of your model? Uh, is it trainable efficiently, right? If you have a neural network parameterizing your computational representation to go from a com complicated to simple space, uh, how easy is it to train it with algorithms that are not too costly? Inference tractability, for feed-forward neural networks, that's very simple, but there's other types of models that just doing prediction, the prediction step can be computationally costly. So that's something to keep in mind. And of course, um, that is the advantage of quantum computers is that you know, if we incorporate large unitary transformations into our models, as we'll see, theoretically, there are unitary transformations that cannot be uh, executed, the, the prediction or sampling step, on a classical computer. Right? So that's a very important uh, part. And that's why I have this slide. <laughs> uh, generalization power is, is the core of machine learning. Generalization is, you know, if I fit within my data set, will uh, what I've learned extend outside the data set, which is important because that is the difference between learning and optimization. I sense there's a question. Oh, <laughs> oh just unmuted. Yeah, we're keen, keen awareness. Um, sure. This is more of a curiosity question okay. the, about the representation capacity. It's, uh, it seems like a really powerful thing, but what can we usually, before, say, running numerical experiments and so forth, uh, you know, how much can we say or, or really peer into that for a particular model you've come up with? Uh, you know, what are the kind of tools and techniques and how far can they allow you to? You know, can we really say a lot about that? Uh, about the, complexity of sampling unitaries? Uh, about, yeah, the representation capacity, like what kind of correlations and so forth you would be able to uh, capture potentially versus not. This is more of a... Uh, right, and that is going to depend strongly on your your the way you parameterize your your transformation. In a sense, you're, uh, by having a parameterized model, you have what is called a hypothesis class. And depending on, on the various choices you've made, uh, you're going to kind of span 
a submanifold of, of states. And the idea is that, um, you know, what is very popular right now is called the hardware efficient uh, onsets. It looks uh, very much like a uh, random quantum circuit like this. It's very tightly packed. And the idea is that if you look at in the space of possible quantum states, it can represent, right? If all of these transformations were parameterized, random, you know, single and two qubit rotations, right? Then theoretically, you know, its complexity is growing larger and larger, right? And in a sense, any quantum state that has a complexity uh, within that complexity radius, you'll be able to reach it. But the problem is because you're spanning such a large space, your training of your quantum neural network becomes harder and harder um, because your hypothesis class is too large, so you're searching over too, too many possibilities. And this is the result known as the, the barren plateaus in the quantum neural network landscape or, or uh, the quantum version of no free lunch theorem where you can't have a one size fits all representation. And that's, that's where physicists come in. Physicists need to have you know, good prior uh, knowledge of uh, the domain of application they're trying to do quantum machine learning in to instruct their choice of representation and parameterization to aid in, in the, the tractability of training. Um, I believe that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I like that <laughs> pretty much there. Because uh, I, I guess, you know, you could try to say, well, if I have some sort of generators uh, that I use for my model, you know, what is the reachability of states? Uh, you know, right. Questions that people ask, what is the reachability? But I think what you're emphasizing here is that reachability is maybe only a first step uh, and maybe having too much reachability is sometimes a detriment. So there's a trade-off maybe between capacity and efficiency. And exactly, exactly. And that, that is the no free lunch theorem in a sense. So that's lucky for us because, uh, you know, at least for now, it seems like physicists will be needed uh, in the future when uh, <laughs> we're not going to be out of a job. We still need to design architectures, um, at least for now. So let's see, <laughs> let's see, let's see where it goes. But, uh, but that's right, that's right. So, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm going to present today is not necessarily uh, architectures for specific domains. It's, it's more, uh, a general framework uh, based on quantum information theory of how to uh, do quantum machine learning or, or maybe a, a, a very broad class of parameterizations of, of, uh, of models that are quantum. Yeah. Guillaume, yeah, um, since I've already interrupted you, there's an interesting, this is kind of an unusual question, but why don't mm -hmm. you throw it out here anyhow from Martin. How much time do you take uh, take it take you to learn all this? <laughs> I guess, um, I mean, so, okay, so I guess backstory, uh, th once there was a conference on machine learning on a Monday, on a Friday night, I decided to binge watch lectures at three times speed on YouTube on the basics of deep learning. I think that was 2016 uh, or 2017, something like that. And uh, since then, I've just been reading uh, machine learning papers and, you know, I, I guess I have a deep math background, so it helps. Uh, and then quantum computing itself, uh, I guess I've been doing since I was 19 and I'm 28 now. So <laughs> gives you an estimate. Uh, it's just always been my passion. And uh, I, uh, I went through theoretical physics and uh, now I'm here in uh, quantum machine learning. So uh, I would say four years of, of uh, interest in quantum machine learning, two to three years uh, serious, uh, serious focus. Yeah. And it looks like George Barron is building on my question, which probably gets into a little bit of what I also wanted to get into, which is what are some uh, quantitative quantitative metrics for representation capacity? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I guess hmm, that's a good that's a good question. I would say if you can quantify of in a sense a, a notion of volume and, and complexity space, um, and this is actually you know we're we're edging on on. Uh, theoretical physics here because the notion of quantum complexity is interested in, interesting in, in the theory of ADS CFT and um, you know there's Leonard Susskind who does a lot of work in this uh, in this space mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah I mean that's a that's a that's an open question I think w I have some intuition uh, as to what would be a good metric but that would be an interesting uh, further study yeah yeah there's a good quote by Henri Poincaré that with uh, with logic we prove but with intuition you discover and seems that's like right here is the guiding that's right cool, cool. um 
so I, I guess I've I've uh, I've gone through these. Uh, this is just some text uh, backing up what I've said. Um, so okay, so now that we've we have some very brief background and some intuition about deep learning because this is a quantum computing audience, so we had to load that up. Um, how can we use you know what we learn taking inspiration from VAEs or uh, from you know the what is needed to have a good representation to instruct our choice of how we do quantum deep learning? So first of all, what would be a quantum deep representation, right? Well, a classical feed-forward network in a cartoonish picture. This is not the most general formulation, but it's a it's a friendly one. Um, you have some input, you have some parameters phi, and then you have some parameterized output f of x phi. For a quantum neural network, you have usually a pure state input, a unitary evolution that is parameterized in some way, and then you have a parameterized hyper hypothesis class of pure states, right? Which is u phi times your uh, initial state, and uh, you know we call the function f the feed forward operation. You can have a uh, loss functional, so returns a scalar that depends on say your label and your your output of your network. Uh, this could be some measure of statistical distance to your data set, and you want to find the uh, minimum or approximate minimum subject to variations of the parameters of this loss functional. So how do we get scalar values out of a quantum computer? It gives us a wave function. So what do, we, what do we do with it? Well, we have to define a loss operator, which is a quantum observable, right? A Hermitian observable. And often we decompose it into small chunks that we can measure independently um, and uh, combine later on. And our goal is similarly to, you know, in the, v, the case of VQE and many other variational algorithms is to find uh, the minimum subject to variations, variational variations of the parameters uh, the expectation value of this loss operator, right? Sometimes it's called the energy or the Hamiltonian, but I like to generalize it to, uh, you know, loss um, for quantum machine learning. So there's just a refresher. This is the typical way one trains a vanilla, uh, what I call vanilla quantum variational algorithms or vanilla quantum neural network. You have a loop between a quantum and classical computer and uh, the quantum computer gets an expectation value, feeds it to the classical computer. Classical computer has an optimization algorithm that's classical, suggests and use values of the parameter, and you iterate like this. In a sense, you know, our current quantum computers are restricted in how much quantum depth and uh, you know what kind of quantum states they can represent. They're restricted in, in depth because of the noise. And so it makes sense that we search over the space, uh, given this constraint of low depth circuits, we should search over the space to find the quantum state. And this is this is why this is kind of taking over because uh, for the NISC era or you know early fault tolerance, we're gonna be searching over the space of states that are uh, not too big, not, not too you know, long to quantum compute. Um, so why learn quantum representations in the first place? If you, if you allow me, I'll modify uh, Feynman's famous quote. Uh, Feynman said, you know, nature is in classical gamut. If you wanna make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And in our case, it's if you want to learn a representation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical, All right? So quantum states and quantum processes, I think we've been, we've been mentioning this, can exhibit high levels of quantum forms of correlation, such as entanglement. And that's exponentially hard to represent in classical memory, right? If you have a, a random circuit producing in a highly entangled state, it's very hard to approximate it. And it's hard to prove uh, theoretically without a doubt, but every algorithm we've tried to simulate quantum circuits, it seems to uh, fall flat on its face at some point, <laughs> right? Um, uh, yes. Guillaume, uh, quick question clarification from Joe here. Is sure. the loss calculated by a classical computer? Mm -hmm. Is the loss calculated? So he's talking about the expectation value of the L operator. Right, right. It takes actually several samples to estimate the expectation value, right? You could think of it as like sampling from a distribution. If I'm trying to do an estimator of a uh, random variable subject to samples from a certain distribution, it takes several samples. So there's, there's like a mini loop in here to estimate the expectation value here. And that's a mixture of uh, you know, doing several measurements on the quantum computer and saving saving the results on the classical computer, and then the classical computer can aggregate the the various results to get an average, right? And maybe to paraphrase, you mean you you run that same U circuit with the same inputs, the same initial state, the same parameters, several different times. measurements. Uh, yes. 
well, I guess the, the loss operator may have several uh, non-commuting uh, sub operators and one wants to get an expectation value of each uh, term in the sum. And then one uh, adds up all these terms to get an expectation value of the sum. So that is called the quantum expectation estimation uh, subroutine in a sense. Uh, and here I kind of uh, abstracted it out, um, but it's, it's an extra subroutine. There's a mini loop of uh, trying to get a, a precise estimate. And it's not to be neglected because if you want, you know, a 10 to the minus seven precision for an energy, it could take you hours uh, on a 10 kilohertz machine, for example. So it's, it's an important thing to consider when designing uh, quantum algorithms that we only have noisy or estimates of our, our loss function. Yeah, yeah, so basically if you run that, um, yeah, so you break up the L into sub operators, which you measure more, you know, you measure by running multiple times you get, you don't need the distribution here for this, you only need the actual mean value. Yes. Right. It, or at least in the, in the typical vanilla case, but as we'll see, there's, there's uh, other, other variants uh, out there, but uh, usually the quantum part, it, it's, it's hard to get a scalar out of a quantum computer by something else than defining an observable and outcomes of measurements. Uh, right. And how important would readout errors and skew in the readout be? You know, for ah. instance, you should get a P1 yeah. probability 80, but you have to skew because of the lost T1 process and things like that. That's right. You get an imprecise estimate of your, your loss function. And uh, you need to have classical algorithms on the side to compensate for that imprecision or to choose your optimizer wisely in a way that is robust to noise. Right, and uh, I, I see a lot of questions. I, I hope I can get to all of these. We may we may have to yeah. use them for the end here. Okay. Um, maybe just a quick one here. Does the quantum advantage come from generating the variational forms? Mm, the quanti I mean, you know, I, I'm not claiming a quantum advantage yet, but I, I would say that uh, if, there, if there was a quantum machine learning advantage, it would likely come from uh, being able to do the inference or prediction step with your model and hence the ability to train it as well. So both the training and inference are rendered possible once you have access to a quantum computer if you incorporate a model that has high quantum complexity, so a large unitary that we can't simulate classically. Um, yep. And I think oh. this next one you're going to talk about, which is backpropagation, you know, can you yes, say yes, 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 yes. Um, Okay, so how to practically uh, leverage uh, quantum computing power? Well, uh, for discriminative models, for example, you can, uh, you know, let's say you prepare a quantum data set, because again, for now, we don't have a quantum internet where we can import uh, data. <laughs> uh, that'd be nice someday. Uh, and you evaluate your quantum model. Let's say you do a, a feed forward or a, a unitary parameterized model. You get uh, the expectation value of say several observables that becomes a vector. You feed that vector to a classical neural network, and then it evaluates some, some prediction based on this, say, a label or whatnot. And the idea is that you can uh, train both your classical uh, part of your network and your quantum part of the network together uh, via a form of quantum classical hybrid backprop. And the idea is that you know, your quantum neural network can, can have all sorts of components, uh, but it could itself be a building block in a sort of meta network between quantum neural networks and classical neural networks. And the idea is that if you zoom in on, say, a little uh, sandwich of, of nodes here, or meta nodes of a deep neural network, a quantum neural network, and a deep neural network, so the, let's say, a deep neural network or any differentiable computation feeds parameters to a quantum neural network. Uh, and then you have the measurement of several observables at the output, which you feed to a classical neural network. And, and then you could do other stuff later on. Uh, and you get your loss function here, then you could get the gradient of the loss function, back propagate uh, your gradient classically. And effectively what's interesting is that this thing is a actually a, itself is, is if technically an observable on this space if you could you know invert this function. But the idea is you do a first order approximation. So you get an effective back propagated gradient Hamiltonian which becomes, or you call it a Hamiltonian because it's an observable. And then it becomes just like taking gradients of a VQE to obtain the gradients of these parameters. You just have an effective uh, value of the gradient for a certain value of your, your, you know, uh, all your parameters over here and your loss function. 
and you could take gradients of uh, that with respect to your parameters, and you've effectively backpropagated the gradient of this value through the QNN, and you could keep going. And this is important because you don't want to have to do a slight change, do your whole chain of computations, see how it changed, and then backtrack. It's it's more scalable uh, this way. Um, so okay, so there's some software uh, that does this. I have to plug it. I mean, uh, it's one of my pet projects uh, for it's been so for a while. Uh, for now, it's uh, it's uh, interface between Circ and TensorFlow. There's some open source contributors that are working on QuizKit comp compatibility. So that's going to be exciting for the QuizKit community and we're supporting them. Uh, but it allows you to you know, automate this, this training and integrate it uh, into you know, advanced machine learning models in TensorFlow. And you know, TensorFlow, I think, uh, has the record of, uh, on IBM uh, supercomputers uh, for you know, the biggest machine learning computation. So I think it's important to, uh, to ideally integrate uh, quantum computers with uh, the power, at least one of the most powerful frameworks for high performance computing on the classical side. Um, so, any question there? In that vein, um, this is an earlier question from Anamita. Are there any data sets available for quantum machine learning models? I think we might have some notebooks for us later. Uh, that's, uh, I, th I think that's public that we're working on that and we're trying to work with other, uh, you know, other, uh, companies in the space to make sure we we agree on what uh, a form for a data set will be. But in general, because you can't download quantum data, you can't just save you know, states because they take exponential space and you don't know how to load them on your quantum computer, the data set takes the form of a circuit um, or a set of circuits. And those define wave functions that you could then do quantum deep learning on. And it's something that's uh, being worked on, but you'll have to stay tuned uh, for that. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So uh, what can one do with hybrid feed-forward networks? Uh, I'm going to skip over this uh, Yeah, quickly, I guess. There's a paper by Lucan, which is a convolutional neural network, which uh, are inspired with from the Mara, if you're in, in the know about it. Uh, basically, it's using the fact that uh, if, if you know your system is translationally invariant, so it has some symmetry, you reflect that symmetry in your, your choice of parameterization of your quantum neural network. And so this is just a quantum neural network that has translational invariance and is hierarchical. And the idea is that you know maybe you can't do all the quantum layers, but maybe you could do only one quantum layer. And already you'll, you've downsampled the problem, you've reduced the dimen dimensionality and you've broken up some entanglement or you've, you've like disentangled partially. Remember for compression, you gotta decorrelate everything, right? So the idea is that you can do, you could input various quantum data in batches, you could apply various feature maps that are quantum convolutional networks, and then you get kind of images from you know, all your histograms of, of samples of your bit strings and following this, you could apply classical convolutional layers and you know finish the job with the fully connected. And at least in our early experiments, uh, hybrid networks with multiple filters were better than uh, one uh, quantum network, and that's without noise. Uh, so with noise on the device, it's even better. Uh, but that's just a, an example of discriminative learning. I won't go too much into that, but in terms of applications, it would be, for example, classifying phases of matter, detecting whether something is superconducting or not. And the idea is maybe you train on a data set of uh, a material you know is superconducting at certain value of the parameters and temperature. And, and then you, you ask the neural network to detect for another material that you don't know whether it's superconducting or not at certain value parameters. So it generalizes. So that's, uh, that's one quote unquote killer app, we think, for uh, quantum neural networks. Um, yeah, so it's just comparing the two with our old diagram. Okay, so I guess we'll get to the meat of the talk. Uh, not, not too bad, halfway there, I guess. Um, so uh, how can we extend these insights and how can we hybridize um, in a meaningful way with classical machine learning capabilities for quantum machine learning, right? Let's go back to our slide of deep generative modeling. We have our data set. We have our variational classical distribution. We want to minimize our question before we... Yep. we... Sure. Deep dive here. Uh, it's about um, NLP and maybe can we use some of this quantum representation and NLP transformers to reduce the huge size of it and increase accuracy? I don't know if that's a, maybe 
a little bit out there question for um, so I mean we our team has some public work that we've used tensor networks which are you know analogous to quantum circuits in a sense to uh, find factorizations of large matrices uh, and we apply them to the transformers and at least in our demo we get a two times speed up uh, and of course um, you know that'd be great if um, such a tensor network could be contracted on a quantum computer uh, faster it's not an experiment we've tried yet but um, you know, it, it's going to come down to constant speed ups, uh, you know, uh, you know, a tensor network versus a quantum computer for certain tensor networks, a quantum computer is exponentially faster, but for other tensor networks, it's going to be similar, uh, potentially. Um, so that is, that is a good question. Um, but, uh, I guess, I guess we'll, we'll have to see on that side, but it's an interesting area of research in a sense, uh, dimensionality reduction. Uh, using uh, quantum circuits um, and, uh, you know, tensor networks are a first uh, step towards that. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's encouraging to see that cutting edge ML can be improved with quantum or quantum inspired methods, at least today. Um, so, yeah, I, I, at least in NLP, that's the area that I'm confident saying something <laughs> that quantum computers would be potentially useful. Um, cool. Good, thank you. All right. Uh, so, so I, I mentioned we want uh, our data set to agree. Uh, you know, for our data points in general, when you want two uh, distributions to agree, you do what is called the KL divergence. Uh, it's not a symmetric function, so be careful. Uh, you could go you go one way or the other uh, between your true distribution, your data distribution, and your uh, variational uh, distribution, right? And it's like here would be the expectation value, expect our data of the ratio of logs, right? So the idea is that to evaluate this kind of gold standard of uh, quantum statistical, or sorry, classical statistical distribution, uh, we need uh, access to the log of our, or logarithm of our uh, model uh, for any given data point X that we sample from the data, right? So not every, uh, classical machine learning model allows you to do to do this right so gans for example don't have an explicit logarithm of the of the density of your generative model that you could query it's implicit it's only you know the discriminator telling you how well you're doing but it's not an, a notion of log whereas you have let's say you do a bunch of transformation that um that you know uh the determinant of the jacobian you could compute that efficiently right the determinant of jacobian if you, if you continuously transform a space, right, and you had initially a simple Gaussian on that space, and you end up with a complicated space, you've kind of, you know, bunched it up and you've done some complicated different morphism, you could backtrack how the notion of volume locally has changed, right? And uh, for any, you know, value we target here, we can kind of invert um, the measure in a certain bin here to uh, some set of bins over here. And we know the value of a Gaussian analytically. And so you could compute, in a sense, uh, somewhat efficiently, uh, analytically, the, um, the density of your, your probability distribution uh, for any point you query. Uh, this is called the normalizing flow. But there's other types of models. You know, there's energy-based models. There's uh, autoregressive models. There's a, a, a whole bunch of, of cool models out there. But a lot of people know GANs because it's like the entry-level entry thing because people understand discriminators. But I would encourage you to check out other types of generative machine learning. And in a sense, we're, we're looking to have an explicit uh, notion of a log uh, for reasons that are going to become apparent in a, in a second in the quantum case. So how can we extend this philosophy to quantum theory? Uh, you know, what's the intersection of quantum theory and probability theory, right? Uh, well, uh, there is, you know, just like in, in black holes, uh, we look at black holes because they're at the intersection of quantum and gravity, so they're an interesting test bed. Well, here we look at mixed states because they're at the intersection of probability theory and probabilistic machine learning and quantum theory and quantum machine learning. So mixed state in general can be a probabilistic mixture over mixed states. These are matrices instead of vectors now, so be careful. Uh, but uh, any density operator has what is called a spectral decomposition, so it, it's always expressible as a mixture of orthogonal uh, pure states, uh, and this this mixture sums up to one, so it has a probabilistic interpretation. So we go from vectors to uh, a density matrix, uh, and each element is in uh, complex numbers. Um, 
So uh, how would we represent mixed states? So how would we represent the intersection of probability theory and quantum theory? Well, we should have a model that composes a probabilistic model with a quantum model, right? And that is the uh, idea of quantum probabilistic hybrid uh, deep learning or deep uh, representations, hence the title of my talk. Uh, <clears throat> so as we've seen, quantum neural networks are typically uh, unitary uh, feed forward like this, and they have a hypothesis class that is uh, pure states. We can combine here a classical parameterized probabilistic model that, that we can sample. And let's say this would flip your qubits. You flip your qubits to prepare a bit string. Then you apply a unitary that's parameterized. And what you get at the output instead of a parameterized class of pure states is a parameterized class of mixed states, right? And uh, you know, your parameterized distribution, your state at this point is a diagonal state. So it's effectively classical. It has no quantum correlations. You can try to show this, uh, show there's no coherent mutual information. Uh, exercise. <laughs> uh, and then after that, you tack on a unitary, which is hard for classical computers to do. So the idea is we use classical computers and we make them, you know, we make them sweat, right? Like uh, inference of probabilistic models can be pretty computationally intense. Uh, and then we combine them with uh, unitaries on the quantum computer. Um, can you say a little bit about how you pick the set for capital omega? Oh yeah, so capital omega is just uh, an index over your basis of your Hilbert space. Uh, it's kind of a general formulation because we actually uh, phrase the algorithm both for qubits and for continuous infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So theoretically it could be a, an integral or something. It, it's just general uh, math, but it's, uh, it's an index that, it's a index set that runs over uh, an index for your, your entire basis that spans your whole Hilbert space of interest. Um, oh, I see, yeah. I see, yeah. And then yeah, you yeah, can yeah. choose basically any probability over basically any Basically anything, but there's going to be certain types that are preferential for, for training reasons, as, as we'll see. Uh, uh, again, you know, you could parameterize anything classically, but it's not every model that's easy to train. Again, because let's say you need the log and you can't get it or can't get the gradients, uh, then it's difficult. So uh, as we'll see, we can choose wisely how we parameterize things so that we can get nice gradients and can train things. Because how do you train continuously parameterized hypotheses class? Uh, Gradient-based methods. So you use kind of the notion of steepest descent in the landscape of parameter space. And uh, maybe one more question. I'm told I have to speak a little bit louder, so hopefully. For sure. Um, for, I mean, let's take the extreme case. You take a case where you have a pure, like, hard mixture, like a hard problem. You know, you have a pure mixture of all states. So I'm guessing that's not a very useful one. So in a way, you want your state to be a little bit mixed, but somewhat pure, or are you okay having like a, a, a purity of like zero <laughs> or, or maximally mixed state in other words? So if you were to optimize over architectures, so tune, and I, I, we have some new results that are not in the paper for this talk, uh, you could tune how much quantum depth you 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 assign to the, the, the unitary. Um, theoretically, this, this approach could be tunable in the sense that if the data set that you're trying to represent is purely classical and has no quantum correlation, and the identities in the span of your unitary hypothesis class, you could learn to just apply the identity. And then it's a classical machine learning system. Uh, if it's a pure state that you're learning, this the probabilistic component is useless in a sense because it's gonna be mm -hmm. all unitary. You're just trying to learn a pure state. So it's an adaptive way to separate out the task of quantum and classical machine learning of a quantum uh, mixed state. Um, and it, it's quite cool because you have one framework where you have as a subset uh, classical generative modeling of, of distributions. Um, so in a sense, it, it, it can, via self-tuning, it could adapt to use no quantum resources or use no classical resources or any you know continuum in between. And uh, we have time here, two more quick questions. So are you using mixed states for the input? Uh, so maybe in practice, I guess at this level, it's all in the more abstract. We're, we're, we're going to see that, I guess. Uh, oh, okay. it's, you could use output or input. So yeah. Um, I think I still have a, a good number of core slides, but I guess I'll I'll go through them faster a bit. Um, we can run so, a little long. Then. Yeah. OK, OK. So you know, why should we care about quantum mixed states? Well, you know. Thermal states um, are at finite temperature. And so, you know, most systems in nature at finite temperature, unfortunately, our quantum computers are not at zero temperature. 
Uh, so even them themselves must be bottled as mixed states uh, if we were to be accurate. And uh, experimentalists know this, theorists like to say it's a pure state. Uh, um, so, you know, so the ability to simulate mixed states is, is crucial to nature. And, and the reality is like, you know, we're trying to use quantum computers to simulate nature, but nature itself, if you coarse grain enough, you, you zoom out, it, it, there's a quantum to classical transition, right? So, you know, we're used to having classical physics, having quantum physics, and then there's a continuum in between. So the point is to have a set of continuum of models that can model that in between at finite temperatures when quantumness dies down and uh, it becomes classical uh, or, you know, when you're very close to being fully quantum, right? Uh, most quantum systems are open quantum systems. I've mentioned this and uh, for various reasons, subsystems of, of, of quantum uh, states uh, have are mixed states because of entanglement. If you take a reduced state of a pure entangled state, you get a mixed state. Um, so just looking at patches of things at, at a time to model them, it's important. So what sort of mixed states in nature can we variationally simulate using something like this? Well, thermal states is of, of great interest because they're they're omnipresent. So the algorithm that leverages quantum probabilistic generative models to model thermal states is uh, qu variational quantum thermalization, and or VQT. Uh, and uh, so the problem is given a Hamiltonian and H and a target temperature uh, one over beta then generate the thermal state, which is the exponential that is normalized like this. Uh, this is the partition function. And the idea is, okay, well, we'll use one of our magic models uh, of uh, classical probabilistic distribution and a, a unitary. Uh, and how are we gonna converge to uh, the thermal state? Well, thermal states are the minimum of something called free energy, right? So free energy is, you know, uh, uh, roughly ignoring temperature, uh, energy minus entropy, right? Uh, so we can evaluate the energy, you know, just like in VQE of our model and subtract the entropy, right? So how do we get the entropy? Well, because unitaries conserve entropy, the act actually the entropy comes strictly from our classical part of the model. And uh, if your classical model has ways to get gradients of entropy, you're in business or you know, sometimes it's simple enough, you could get it analytically. And this is equivalent to finding, you know, the minimum of the relative entropy between our model and the thermal state. So, you know, we know that the unique minimum of this uh, function is when the two states match. So if we do our job well and we parameterize things well and find the absolute optimal state, uh, then, uh, you know, we've hit the jackpot. Um, state of minimal free energy is thermal state. So how do we parameterize our quantum probabilistic generative model? I've been pretty abstract now, so we're just gonna zero it in slightly. Uh, well, uh, the motivation for this work was to take inspiration from recent work by uh, OpenAI and such on uh, modern versions of energy-based models where one, it's, it's, anal it's taking inspiration from physics, right? So you define an energy function using a classical neural network, let's say from the space of bit strings or continuous values to, to a scalar. And you could use various algorithms that leverage gradient information, such as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. Uh, you know, all, 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 there's a bunch of open source frameworks to, to do the, this part. You could sample the landscape by, in a sense, having a noisy uh, ball traverse this landscape. And you get samples of the exponential this way, or the Boltzmann distribution known in physics. It's a classical Boltzmann distribution. So you parameterize the energy. And why, why is that gonna be useful? Well, uh, it, it has all sorts of compositionality uh, perks. Uh, it, it's, it's very good. It's comparative uh, with GANs. This is work by OpenAI 2019. So how do we leverage these models and integrate them with quantum computers? Well, so, you know, what if we had our probabilistic part of our model was a classical energy-based model like this? So it's parameterized energy function, and then our distribution is a Boltzmann distribution. Uh, again, well, if you... You, you could define a diagonal operator, uh, which is the log uh, after you flip some bits, uh, which is your energy function on the diagonal. And what you get, uh, if you do some math with some unitaries and exponentials, is that you've just parameterized a operator. The diagonal is parameterized by a neural network and, and the total operator is this conjugation of a unitary with this diagonal operator. And so you've, you've parameterized a Hamiltonian operator and your hypothesis class is a set of thermal states. 
So in a sense, you, you know, you know, you're targeting a thermal state, so you might as well have a hypothesis class of thermal states, right? Um, okay. So if we have this assumption that we're using an energy-based model, how do the gradients work out? Well, uh, there's a bit of math involved. I've skipped uh, many lines, uh, <laughs> but uh, it is possible to sample it. Uh, essentially, you have to get bit strings at the output of your model, and you can uh, evaluate, you can compare uh, the uh, value of the energy of your, your bit strings minus the, the energy of your model. And uh, you can also evaluate gradients of your, your model if it's parameterized by a neural network. And you, you do the sampling, which only depends again on uh, sampling from, uh, from your, uh, your model, uh, P theta of X, and you have sampling algorithms and you can evaluate gradients. In a sense, it's an analytic way to guarantee that your estimates of your gradients are unbiased. Um, and how do you get gradients for the quantum part? Uh, well, the quantum part is just the usual. Uh, I hope you've seen this in other talks and uh, I'm, I don't have time to cover it. Unfortunately today, it's the parameter shift rule, right? Uh, which is how you take gradients in the VQE, uh, which is how do you take gradients of a, a unitary, a state fed through a unitary and an expectation value. So I won't cover that, but uh, it's very standard. It's you know, a standard in, in the software framework, and uh, there's various papers that use this. Um, it's a cool theory, but you know, does it work, right? Uh, the answer is yes. You know, if you if you have a target thermal states, you can uh, do a reconstruction like this. This is for some Heisenberg spin model. We use very simple classical distribution here. It was just Bernoulli, so random coins. Uh, and, and the quantum computer can do a lot of work and, and learn to represent a thermal state. We've done much larger systems, but you know, a, a jarbled set of pixels is not necessarily the most aesthetic thing. So we, we choose to feature the smaller systems, but uh, we've scaled things up quite a bit. And uh, the idea is um, you know, the function we're optimizing is relative free energy, but the other metrics of quantum statistical distance uh, also converge. Uh, so uh, it, it seems to work. Um, we've also tried some set of fermionic uh, systems and bosonic systems, for example, a simple, you know, toy model of a superconductor that's uh, bosonic, uh, sorry, Gaussian fermionic. So that's quite simple. We can plot the correlation functions, the target, this is at iteration zero and it converges by iteration hundred of gradient descent, uh, pretty well. Um, so this is actually a new result I, I'd like to feature that's not in the paper, uh, but it's coming in the second version of it. Uh, can we tune how much quantum versus classical resources we use, right? So suppose I, I look at this Heisenberg model and I look at after training, how, how well I do in terms of trace distance and fidelity, depending on the temperature and the number of quantum layers I use. Ah, well, we see there's certain sets of temperatures uh, that, uh, you know, you, you need more quantum layers to, to model them, right? And it's not necessarily, you know, at this point it becomes trivial. Uh, at this point, uh, there's a nice balance between quantum and classical resources. And this is the fidelity, this is trace distance, uh, but uh, this is kind of what you, you'd like to do, right? You wanna use as little quantum resources as possible uh, in order to have an accurate representation of a state. So this is something we started investigating, but it's, um, you know, and it maybe has some deep implications about what's the true quantum complexity of a quantum machine learning problem. Uh, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, please take a look at these QR codes. There's links to various notebooks and, you know, I've been advertising TensorFlow Quantum, but there's there's obviously, you know, implementations in QuizKit from the community. A uh, shout out to Jack Cerrone and, uh, you know, the TensorFlow Quantum implementations by my collaborator, Antonio Martinez. Um, and three, two, one, take a picture on YouTube or whatnot and look at the uh, websites uh, for these notebooks. So the final component is more machine learning. It's less quantum simulation. It's how do we use VQT to do quantum machine learning? So if we're given quantum mixed state data, how do we uh, learn from quantum mixed state data? So again, we're gonna use our quantum Hamiltonian based model because uh, for reasons that are going to become apparent in a second. So we call the task of learning to replicate, right? We want an approximate density matrix that approximates a data density matrix. So a data density matrix could be itself a mixture of a bunch of density matrices. We're just trying to approximate this thing. And we want to find a set of parameters such that uh, for the optimal parameters, 
our hypothesis class approximates this density matrix. And we assume we have access to the quantum form of the data, okay? And the idea is if you use a quantum Hamiltonian based model and you aim to minimize now the relative entropy in reverse from last time, uh, what you get is if you ignore the terms that don't depend on your parameters, you get something called the cross entropy, which is this, the trace of sigma, uh, which is your data log rho, right? And again, because we've parameterized our hypothesis class in terms of its logarithm, its quantum logarithm, uh, we can evaluate this energy. This It's called modular energy or modular free energy. And modular Hamiltonian is just a name for the log of a density matrix, okay? And so we're trying to learn a, a log of a density matrix such that the exponential replicates our data set. And how you do this, you plug your data, you run it in reverse through your unitary of your quantum probabilistic model, you sample it, and then you get expectation values uh, of the uh, diagonal operator. And this could be parameterized with a neural network, so you can have more computation here. The extra term here is all on the classical computer. Turns out you could also get gradients for these. I won't go too much into it. Uh, the quantum part is, again, uh, parameter shift. But these gradients, again, if you have a differentiable function for your energy, uh, you know, like a neural network, then you can evaluate uh, you could sample these gradients and it's unbiased, which is really cool. Uh, that, that's really important that we could get uh, good estimates of the gradients. And, um, you know, it works out uh, if you don't use enough quanta or not enough uh, layers of your quantum computer or not enough um, complexity of your classical distribution. Sometimes it doesn't work well. So for various temperatures, we've tested this. And uh, I guess this is a... This is, you know, there's many things you could do once you have unsupervised learning. For example, you could learn a compression code. So here we actually applied, um, hopefully some of you know about bosonic uh, quantum computing, but uh, theoretically it could be applied to uh, other forms that are not qubits. And here we learn a compression code where we could throw, you know, 40% of uh, a harmonic chain uh, in the compressed space and still reconstruct the states. So this is the error uh, matrix of the density matrix. 0.7, we start seeing errors. And if you throw 90% of stuff out, uh, things go bad. And uh, there's theory uh, that you can find the logarithm modes, the modular modes of the system. And so we checked it with theory. And that's why we looked at the system. Yeah. Um, but that's it. That's why uh, curves there. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. What, what are the X and Y axes on that curve again? This curve? On the, on the left. Um, oh, on, on this slide. So yeah. this is the density matrix. It's uh, it's the, it's the di discrepancy between the, so we go to compressed space. It's like an autoencoder. We go to compressed space and then we throw out uh, what is like, so, okay. So, so we, we, do, we learn a VQT and the latent model is a product of individual um, thermal states of harmonic oscillators, right? And those are like quantum forms of Gaussians, which is kind of cool. And we throw out the lower entropy latent modes, okay? Because the well, entropy represents the, a, a harmonic oscillator. Sorry. Or uh, when you say a mode, you mean harmonic a, oscillator of, of a harmonic oscillator. Yeah. yeah. So this is in this is for say a bosonic uh, continuous yeah. variable quantum computing. I, I did most of my time in continuous variable stuff before. So. <laughs> uh, my, myself as well in theoretical physics. Uh, this yeah. is similar to a calculation of the Hawking effect, actually. Um, I, th that's a whole two hours. <laughs> I won't go into that. Yeah. But actually, uh, here's an interesting thing. I have this in, in my summer school lectures that are up and coming. Uh, there, there are only two types of physicists, and those for whom all of physics is qubits and those for whom all of physics is oscillators. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, I try to uh, play on both sides. So uh, hopefully someday we can have hybrid computers. That'd be cool. Uh, the rare ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so yeah, so we agree with theory here. Um, I could explain how this is related to the Hawking and Unruh effects, uh, but uh, <laughs> that would take some time. But it's it's an interesting uh, thing that quantum machine learning could theoretically understand or learn an analog of the Hawking or Unruh effects. That you uh, there there exists a certain set of modes that uh, an observer uh, feels. Uh, uh, thermal statistical uh, fluctuations of, of the vacuum. So this was the ground state we plug it in. And if you transform it, then it becomes a product of thermal states. 
And instead of Fourier modes, it's like these weird squished modes uh, of the lattice. So it's kind of information theoretic uh, eigen modes instead of, you know, we're used to eigen modes in physics like the resonance, but uh, here it's kind of uh, the resonance of, of the log uh, Hamiltonian, which is the modular Hamiltonian. And uh, this brings us actually to the end uh, of, of the talk. And uh, oh, I I've luckily haven't exceeded too much. Uh, so we do have time for questions, I guess. But uh, I just want to conclude, I guess, uh, you know, this is the beginning of a whole research program. It's an exciting area. And, you know, by starting from basics of information theory, right, we just started thinking about relative entropy and inspiring ourselves from physics. We have discoveries in machine learning, and hopefully now we could apply this back to, to physics, right? So it's a feedback loop between physics and machine learning, and it's that's a big part of the philosophy of our team at X. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think there were some questions during the talk that I didn't get to, so maybe I'll kind of run up the chat here and get back to them again. Um, right. Oh, nice. uh, I guess I'll, I'll just do a shout out to Antonio, oh, yeah, uh, my collaborator at Waterloo. Uh, he was at Google and X, and Jacob was instrumental to a lot of the VQT and, and QMHL work, and uh, you know, did, did a lot of the work there uh, as well. So big shout out to them. Uh, but uh, yeah, so any questions in the chat? I've seen a lot of questions in the, yeah. in the chat here. So let's, let's, uh, let's, get, let's see how many, how many we can answer. I guess. All right. Let's start with uh, the latest one, which is about temperature. I think the question is um, now, is there a sense of critical temperature here re relative to some sort of phase transition? Uh, you, you know, are temperatures where you get noisy data closer to critical temperature, some sort of phase transition in the simulator system, or is that? <clears throat> well, I don't know if we purposefully chose a system where we knew there was a phase transition, but we can kind of see that there's different uh, regimes where you need more entanglement or need less entanglement, right? So seeing how many layers you need to represent a quantum state could be like seeing a dip in that could, could be a way to detect different phases or quantum phases of matter, I guess, like, you know, regimes of parameter space that have very strong entanglement and regimes that are, you know, slight, you know, almost trivial. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we, purposely picked a system that we knew there was a phase transition. We just observed uh, this data for now, but um, maybe mm -hmm. something to do uh, later on. Yeah, um, was, let's see this one. Uh, this one is about universal estimators. Basically, can uh, QNNs, you know, neural nets, be used to imitate this kind of behavior? I guess I'm, we're saying, you know, given th that three layer neural nets are regarded as universal estimators in classical machine learning. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I guess you know you want if you have a universal functional approximator, um, then you know theoretically you can have a a universal uh, you know you span the, the space of functions that you could represent. Of course, any qua classical computation can be embedded uh, if you write it out as a reversible classical computation using many extra registers, and you keep the whole history of the computation if it's not reversible uh, functions. You can embed that right in quantum computations with Toffoli gates instead of AND and so on. And some of uh, work several years ago, I, I showed how to take, you know, typical classical neural networks and make quantum circuits that implement the classical neural network in superposition. Um, so the idea is yes, I think you can use quantum neural networks to do the classical probabilistic machine learning components. Um, though so far, at least from uh, the current state of the art of the theory. It seems like quantum computers will have a polynomial speed up for inference, uh, probabilistic inference, uh, similar to Grover speed up. Uh, and that, of course, if we're competing with extremely large classical computers, will be mostly relevant when quantum computers are of a size comparable to the square root of our largest supercomputer. Uh, and um, that is, yeah, that's, I guess that's, uh, that's my answer. So for now, I guess the most practical approach is to use classical algorithms and classical computers for the classical component and use quantum computers for the truly quantum component, which is uh, the unitary. Yeah, that seems like a very nice, sensible thing. There is a question. This one is interesting. I think it's more of an opinion question, maybe. Um, we know that quantum Fourier transform is very key in usual digital quantum computing. 
Um, does it have a role in machine learning? Is it similar in here? What, you know, what is the relationship with Vantage and, and the, the Fourier transform? Yeah. Right. The, so I guess here we parameterized our quantum neural network uh, as a general uh, bosonic, um, what is called Bogolyubov or, or Gaussian transformation. And the discrete Fourier transform is a subset of such transformations. And here we, we learned these transformations. So uh, technically, uh, if we fed the whole system and we asked it to find the eigenmodes, and if, if we had a, a thermal state of this system, say via VQT, and then we fed it to quantum modular Hamiltonian learning, these modes would be the Fourier modes because we know the eigenmodes of, of this Hamiltonian, right? We know how to decompose this, this Hamiltonian uh, into a sum of individual uh, you know, number operators. Um, and that's the same, you know, finding this bulk above transformation is what I mean by it's related to the Unruh effect uh, calculation, QFT and curved space time. I know there was some chat messages that were doubting that, but uh, I did my master's in quantum field theory and curved space time, so you can trust me on that one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, great. So. <laughs> and maybe for the final question here, um, and thank you for taking the extra time. Um, if we want to do research in this field, where should we start or what should be our direction of research? Right. I mean, that's a, that's a good question, I guess. Uh, you yourself have gone through this transition, not, you know, four years ago, I think you mentioned. Right, 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 right. So I guess in my case, I started, you know, I started with, uh, the open, you know, source, uh, massively online courses, MOOCs. I just listened to that, I listened to a few of them, and then I progressed to, uh, I wish I had all my textbooks here, but uh, they're, they're back there, but uh, the Goodfellow, Ian Goodfellow's textbook, um, Inventor of GANs, and then uh, Murphy, Kevin Murphy, uh, a Googler, uh, he did uh, uh, what I call the, kind of the Nielsen and Schwang, or the Bible of probabilistic machine learning. And I think there's uh, McKay, there's uh, information theory for machine learning. That's if you want the textbook route, uh, otherwise, I think with time, as the field stabilizes, I guess, because it's been moving so fast, everybody who's involved in it is just cranking out papers ra rather than uh, creating coursework. Uh, there will be coursework. Um, I could link a, a U Waterloo course uh, that I uh, gave some guest, guest lectures at that, uh, that uh, featured some quantum machine learning. Uh, but uh, overall, I would say it's important to understand the theory of classical machine learning at the fundamental level because you know, similar to hardware engineering, we're at the fundamental level of re-engineering a new computing stack. So on the theory side, we're re-engineering a whole algorithm stack. So we got to start again from first principles. So, you know, you have to trace back to like papers from the eighties of machine learning and, and the fundamentals and then, and then work your way back to the modern, uh, modern things. So I would say the, the modern ML stuff is flashy and, and, and fun to, to stay up to date, but I would say, you know, take the time, go back to the, the core old literature, you know, the foundations. So, um, yeah, uh, MOOCs and then textbooks is the way to go. That's, that's what I did. And here I am. So. And then maybe I can just add that now there are summer school classes coming online. So I mentioned the quantum information Kiskit one. I think there's a touching of, uh, ML and things like that in the last two lectures in quantum chemistry, VQE is definitely on there. So. Fantastic. Anyone interested in addition to, to what you said, uh, Yon, we can add that. Um, so I think it is that time that I That's get right. to thank you again and thank the listeners for joining the Quantum Live seminar series. Uh, we're back this Friday. Um, I will mention next week we're back so this, at the same time, uh, continuing with a talk by Antonio Mizukapo from IBM on quantum uh, chemistry. We could talk about variational quantum eigensolvers, QIO, and things like that, on chemistry things. So that will be a very nice uh, follow-up to your talk, uh, Guillaume. And uh, thank you. I thank you for inviting me. It's uh, It's been an honor. And uh, hopefully the uh, quantum community is interested in quantum machine learning now. Uh, so yeah. hopefully I've done my job there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Follow, follow uh, Guillaume on Twitter. Quantum Verd. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. So any final words and otherwise, thank you and we'll see you next week.
Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thanks again for tuning in and uh, stay home, stay safe, everyone. And uh, thank you. All right. Yeah. It was a pleasure, Gail. We'll see you soon, guys. Take care. Cheers.